In my early days in Tamworth Elim, I invited a missionary named Gordon McKillop to speak in a midweek service. Gordon and his wife Sybil left the UK to work in uh, Central Africa as Elim missionaries some 40 years ago. I had not met Gordon before, or since actually, but I immediately liked the guy. He was someone I believed who had both feet firmly planted on the ground. There appeared to be nothing airy-fairy or otherworldly about him. Practical, down-to-earth, straightforward, sensible, realistic, occasionally hilarious. And by the way, if you're listening to this video, Gordon, you can send a check in the post. Yes, I was really impressed by the guy. We had a great evening learning all about their work in Central Africa. Well, roll on a uh, few years and I noticed an article that Gordon had written for the Elim Direction magazine. Having met him on a previous occasion, I was really interested to read the article. It was a story of something that happened to them way back in 1984. It's a story of a telephone call and God. I read the article and I chuckled. Actually, I laughed out loud. And I was reminded of how nothing is impossible with God. In fact, God laughs at impossibilities. Gordon and Sybil needed to travel to the city of Lubumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo to get supplies. When they were there, they planned on staying in the home of Methodist mission missionaries Stan and Linda Ridgway, who had scheduled to take a short break with their children, leaving Gordon and Sybil to house sit. During their stay, uh, in the Congo, Gordon at one point needed to travel about 200 kilometers into neighboring Zambia. When he was there, he took the opportunity to phone his parents because there was no easy access to phones in Congo. The first thing his father said was, did you get my telegram? Now, for all young people, a telegram was a means of electric, uh, electronic communication before mobile phones and the internet. If you're not sure, ask your grand grandparents. Father asked, did you get my telegram? Gordon said no, and asked him what was wrong. Gordon's father then broke the sad news that Sybil's father had died. Later that evening, Gordon needed to break uh, this terrible news to his wife about her dad's death. They felt very, very isolated, especially since uh, none of the phones worked in the home of the Methodist missionaries. Before they left for the short break with their family, Stan had told Gordon and Sybil that the phones in their house had not worked for many years because all the wires and had been broken or stolen. Gordon said that even though he had heard and understood what Stan had said to him regarding the telephones, that they would not worked in years because the wires had been stolen. His natural inclination, as much out of desperation as anything else, was to pick up the telephone and guess what? He heard a dialing tone. He dialed straight through to his father to make sure it worked. It did. Sybil then phoned her family almost constantly for the next week until the time of her dad's burial. When Stan and Linda came back, the McKillops confessed to them that they'd used their telephone frequently in their absence. Well, Stan laughed, saying, you couldn't have. <laughs> There's no wiring. They've stolen everything from the box. There's not a single wire in any of the telegraph poles. Stan took Gordon outside, and it was just as Stan had said. No wires, no connections, nothing. But we've been phoning all week through to Scotland, said Gordon. Well, the next day, Gordon went to the post office in the middle of the city of Lubumbashi and spoke to a lady there requesting a bill for the calls he'd made on Stan's telephone. She said, there's no phones in that part of town. There are no wires. Gordon repeated the story and told her that he had been phoning Scotland. She then showed him a whole side of a switchboard that they no longer use anymore. Well, Gordon and Sybil were in no doubt who was behind that incredible miracle at such a desperate time for them. There's more. The telegram sharing the sad news of Sybil's dad's death, to which Gordon's father had referred, arrived six weeks after they'd spoken on the phone. But because of God's amazing provision, Sybil 
had the opportunity to grieve for her father um, with her family over the telephone. Wow, that is some story. What do you think? Far-fetched? Some kind of urban myth that has gained momentum over the years? And that's probably what I would have thought if I had not previously met Gordon. I think that the God who can laugh at telecommunication impossibilities is the same God who can handle any situation that we bring to him. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus those well-known words in praise of God as the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Immeasurably more. Immeasurably more than all we ask. Immeasurably more than all we can imagine. <laughs> what are you, our imagination is like? What's your imagination like? Our trouble is sometimes that we get faint-hearted and the reason we get faint-hearted is that our God is too small. Martin Luther once told Erasmus, the humanist leader of the Renaissance, your thoughts of God are too human. Well, I confess that's me on occasion and it's, it's probably you too. There are times when we can become unbelieving believers. I think that it's possible to believe in God's omnipotence, his almightiness, his godness in our heads. We can sing fabulous songs about his greatness and his might and creating planets and raising the dead and turning water into wine. And that he is the one for whom nothing is impossible. But occasionally there can be a disconnect between what we read in the scriptures and the songs that we sing and our trust in his awesome ability. As good evangelical Christians, we believe in the Bible. We believe that it's inspired and trustworthy. And when it said that Jesus stilled the storm and cast out demons and healed the sick and raised the dead, all those things happened. But then, when it comes to believing that this same God is able to still the storm in my life, or that the God who raised the dead could bring spiritual life to that family member who is spiritually dead to the things of God, there's sometimes a disconnect. Well, today we're in Acts chapter 12 in our present series, The Gospel Unleashed. In this chapter, we witness the example of a disconnect between believing something at surface level and truly believing. I'm sure that most of you will know this story really well. The regional king at the time was Herod Agrippa I, who was in Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And in what appears to be an attempt to curry favour with the temple authorities in Jerusalem, he orders a clampdown on Christians. Now most of the Jewish religious leaders disliked followers of Jesus at best, but at worst wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth as followers of a, a false messiah. There was no love lost. Well, Herod Agrippa I, grandson of Herod the Great who slaughtered the babies in uh, Bethlehem, knows what would please the religious authorities. Pick on the Christian community. Well, his first victim was James the Apostle, the brother of John, one half of the Sons of Thunder, who is killed with a sword, probably beheaded. Peter is next in line. He was imprisoned and awaiting execution. Peter was temporarily saved from death because it was Passover week, an execution at this time was against Jewish tradition, so Peter was left to spend a few days in prison before losing his head. In the face of this persecution, the church in Jerusalem did the only thing that they could. They met together and prayed. For them, prayer wasn't the last resort as it is for us sometimes, but it was a first resort. We read in Acts chapter 12 verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. What a great verse that is. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Things were bad, very bad. The church was being persecuted. Believers arrested. James the Apostle had been killed. Pe Peter was next, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. But what were they praying? Well, we're not told. But I, can, I think we can safely assume that they were praying for Peter's protection and safe release. Well, good on them. 
they had undoubtedly prayed for James in the same way, but on that occasion, their prayers didn't stop James from being killed. But their despair in losing James, their disappointment in not having the prayers answered, their possible disillusionment, disillusionment in God, who could have done something but didn't, didn't actually discourage or deter them from praying some more. They still prayed earnestly, so Luke tells us. Now that verse reminds me of the words of King David in Psalm 109. In the first few verses of the psalm, uh, where David speaks about all those who oppose him, the enemies who attack him without cause, they speak words of slander and hatred towards him. In return for David's friendship, they accuse him. But against this backdrop, he says, but I am a man of prayer. Essentially, do your worst, throw whatever you will at me, accuse me, slander me, gossip about me, bring it on. But I am a man of prayer. Not just a man who prays, but a man of prayer. And recently things have been very tough for us at our church. Quite an onslaught in many ways. Illnesses, bereavement, big challenges. But the church, Tamworth Elim Church, has prayed earnestly to God. Despite our disappointments and challenges, as a community of believers we continue in various ways. One-to-one, -one, small groups by Zoom, by the prayer network, pray earnestly, choosing to trust. Well, let's come back to Acts chapter 12. The scene moves to the prison. We're told that Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound in chains. Sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel woke Peter and his chains fell off. The angel then led Peter out of prison. Luke writes in verse 9, Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> Peter was baffled. Is this for real? Am I dreaming? They passed through the first and second guards out into the street. Then the angel left him. Luke tells us that Peter had just waltzed past 16 guards to freedom. Then he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, who had gathered to pray. Peter knocked the door and a servant came, girl named Rhoda went to answer. But she, when she heard Peter's voice, she ran back in to tell the others without opening the door first. Peter's at the door, she said. They response, you must be out of your mind. She insisted that it was so, but they still couldn't believe her words. So they suggested that it might be his angel. It's like a scene from Monty Python, this. Peter kept knocking and eventually they let him in. And this story has all the elements of a comedic farce. Peter in prison, the church was praying fervently for his release. God sends an angel to do the business. Peter is miraculously released, even though he was guarded by 16 guards. Then Peter cannot get into a prayer me meeting where he was top of the prayer list that evening. Because, wait for it, they couldn't believe that it was him. They rather believed in some far-fetched theory about it being his angel. I'm not sure about that theology, by the way. Of course, these Christians believed. That is why they took time to gather and pray. They believed in miracles. They believed in the supernatural. They believed in angels, it appears. But when it came to the crunch, their belief was probably more head than heart. There was a disconnect. And we sometimes romanticise the members of the early church, assuming that they were all spiritual giants. But they were made of the same frail flesh as us. And I can imagine that they'd almost given up. James had been murdered, Peter was soon to be killed, and I detect an atmosphere of hopelessness among them. They were a small band of frightened Christians, huddled together, trying to stay under the radar, wondering what on earth was going on, praying desperately, probably too scared to believe that a knock at the door could ever be a good thing. And we, 2,000 years on, can have a laugh at their expense. Ho, 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 praying earnestly for Peter and unable to believe that their prayers affected the outcome. And we're not like that, are we? <laughs> Much. Don't you see yourself in that place on times too? There's a challenge, and that's a challenge to us today. As Luther said, our thoughts of God are too human. 
The things that we believe about God always affect the way that we act as Christians. In fact, that is so important, I want to just say that again. The things we believe about God always affect the way that we act as Christians. And if you believe that uh, in a God of amazing grace, then it changes everything. Grace is the most radical, Christ-like, countercultural, deep-seated, far-reaching response to a hurting world. If you believe in a God of amazing goodness, then it changes the way that you view God, His testing, the trials you encounter in life, the challenges you see your face. You know that even in the midst of the storm, He is with you. If you believe in a God of amazing greatness, then you will know that no situation or circumstance is beyond his ability, and he has not lost any of his ancient power. Isaiah puts it brilliantly in Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. It's so important to believe the right things about God. And if you are wanting to understand what God is like, start with Jesus. Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. How does God deal with his enemies? Does he punish them? Does he get revenge? Well, actually, he chooses forgiveness. He prays blessing on those who curse him. What is our God like? He is a God who prays for people who have committed the most violent and sinful action this world has ever known by nailing the Son of God and Saviour of the world to a cross and prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That is what God is like. I was talking to a friend the other day who suggested that the God that some Christians believe in is an ugly version of the God who is actually revealed in Jesus. I know what my friend meant by that. And I have seen some over the years believe in a God who looks nothing like Jesus. Their God is a God of anger and harsh words to people who normally don't look like them. Someone else said to me the other day, the problem with Tamworth Elim Church is that they focus too much on grace. <laughs> well, I laughed out loud. Firstly, there is no such thing as focusing too much on grace. Grace is the most wonderful, greatest message and gift to the world. The unconditional, never-ending, reckless love of God, which chases me down, fights till I am found, leaves the 99. A good parent will always discipline a child, but the goal of discipline is always the good of the child. And it is motivated by love. The goal is never punishment for punishment's sake. It is restoration, not abandonment. And with God, love is the last word. Why? Because God is a God of love. He is the epitome of love. He defines love. His love is always a just love and his justice is always a loving justice. You see, the attributes of God can never cancel each other out. That is, in some actions he acts justly and in some actions he acts lovingly. That's very bad theology. God is 100% love. 100% justice, 100% holiness, 100% patience, 100% righteousness in all of his actions, all of the time. And secondly, and don't tell anyone about this, but I felt rather chuffed at the accusation that that time with Elim Church focuses too much on grace. Fancy that. Fancy being a church known for grace. Shock. Horror. How terrible. Sackcloth and ashes. Well, let me just draw to a close. I am so glad that Luke included this episode in his second volume. Why? Well, it presents the Christian faith realistically. A mixture of highs and lows, of great faith, of niggling doubt. Those early Christians are portrayed warts and all. They carry on persevering in prayer after their friend James has been killed. Yet these godly intercessors cannot believe that God has actually answered their prayer for Peter's release. Don't know about you, but I see myself in that portrait, occasionally soaring in faith, sometimes swallowed in doubt, occasionally believing in God for the impossible, sometimes even questioning God's existence. Life is tough on times, and I know that many of you, many of you watching today, 
uh, life has thrown you some curveballs recently, those circumstances that have caused you maybe to ask, where are you, God? Are you there at all? For those Christians who met in Mary's home, this was as bad as it gets. James dead, Peter imprisoned, Christians persecuted. However, the church earnestly prayed. And in the middle of the storm, let us continue being a community of prayer, trusting in God, continuing as William Carey, the great missionary to India, once said, to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And finally, finally, Acts chapter 12 opens with James dead, Peter in prison, Herod overcoming. The chapter closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the good news of Christ overcoming. In other words, God always wins. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great week.